in the in the basement where I had my gear set up, where, where it was it was set up for demoing purposes for my own records, and I'd accumulated enough stuff that I could in, invite some friends over to record. Um, I mean, I always had recording gear like um, four track or was like eleven, eight track, seventeen half inch. And then, so it was natural that I would continue, you know, to have a studio and that it would get bigger. Um, but I think not having a record deal allowed me, you know, at the end of like 2000 or 2001, I had the gear and the, set and the setup and the space, and then all of a sudden I had time because I didn't have like, I didn't have to make a record. So I just started, people started just coming um, because I invited them at first and then other people came. Yeah, it's uh, always been a vague concept. So I like to have it be as short as possible. I think I, there are, there was a concept, or is a concept, of pre-production from the you know, older days of recording, of bigger budgets and more time and more drawn out processes from like the late 70s, 80s, early 90s maybe, where the, but you know, there was, making a record was an inflated process, so you had like this inflated pre-production time. And so I think that some, you know, by the time I personally was making records, um, the producer was young enough at that point, you know, in 95, that he, pre-production was a two-day afternoon, you know, two afternoons in a, in a row at his, with his little, um, I don't know if it was Pro Tools by then, but he had a little computer studio set up at home in his apartment. Um, and it was basically just uh, doing edits from my fairly well-developed demos. So that was just natural to me, and so I, I like to keep the pre-production, you know, by email <laughs> to start. Like, send me the demos, let me map out the arrangements in my head and give you suggestions for arrangements. Maybe a few production ideas, but I'd rather come to that later. Mm -hmm. Basic arrangement stuff. And, you know, usually that is, you know, usually the artist usually agrees with those things. So in my experience, it's been quick. I like to, I mean, I don't like demos really because they often end up, there end up being things that you like about them so much. So why not just start the, 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 the actual master recording as early as possible? So if you get any of that great unintentional inspired stuff that comes early on in the song's genesis, it often does, either performance-wise or part-wise. You've got it, there it is, and you've got it through a good signal chain already. Um, well, most recently was the acquisition of the 24-track MCI machine. So that's been the latest step. I mean, I could go back further, but I mean, that's the most recent one that I remember mm -hmm. the most because I'm just in the middle of it, is um, uh, in general, I mean, I'm using it for, I'm experimenting it, I'm experimenting with it in different ways, but um, in general, recording and editing drums in Pro Tools, having a finished edit, edited take and then shooting them out to the 24 track, and then back in. Just A being the mixes at low volume, it's just hearing that satisfying you know, tape response has been amazing. Um, if it's a really good band, it's really fun to set up, you know, maybe a three-piece setup, guitar, bass, and drums, or piano, bass, and drums. Um, 
for the performance aspect and for the nice bleed if you control the bleed nicely. You know, set things up nicely. You have that and treat that as almost like one, like a stereo track when you're when you're done tracking it anyway. And then if you need to do overdubs, you're kind of just working with this pretty much pre-mixed thing if you do it right. And hopefully, you know, if you don't, for me, I, I, don't, I don't have separation here, so I kind of have to record a take, go back, move things around, mm -hmm. set it up. But 90% of things are started with a click track and it's built up with drums from the ground up. mostly seeking me out um, but um, I definitely you know some of my friends who do the same thing as I do are you know kind of more active on the internet and the phone just like seeking seeking people out to work with because there's so many you know kind of cool artists that are just presenting their demos on the internet and um, are using their home recording setups and people like us add a whole level of stuff that mm -hmm. can really benefit. You know, you hear a great song with a bad mix, you're like, wow, I could really go to town on that. So I'm trying to be a little bit more open or, you know, communicative with people that I like. Because I do just come across a lot of just like, you know, homemade stuff just sent my way by people that, you know, that are not the bands themselves. And so I'm exposed to a lot of stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And rarely kind of go out for them, but probably should do it. Um, positive in that, well, this particular area of Canada, which is a small town, um, has been, was, I mean, always for me great because of the, of no distractions, no rural distractions at all. Um, so you, just, you, you can just refine and hone and experiment so, so much more than when I lived in bigger cities where you just spend a lot of your life, life kind of negotiating daily life in the city. There's a uh, bunch of hours during the day that you need to devote to that, to, to live in that environment, which is fine, you just for it, it's fine. Um, the thing that I miss is is kind of just the more random running into other musical people <laughs> and then just starting things up. That's what I miss the most. Um, and I like I like just being I like being here more. It's the benefits outweigh because I just get to spend more time and tweak more and get into it more. Depends on the artist and depends on the song. And I would say it's about 50-50 for me, just in practical situations, as to whether, um, I, I always just, you know, for the run through take, by halfway through the song, I have my settings set, and then I can kind of just focus on, you know, are they getting tired after verse one? Is there, you know, does, at the end of the verse and going into the chorus, is it like a sh short enough spot where when they come into the chorus, is there, is there not enough breath time for them to really give enough energy if that energy is needed for the chorus part? Just listen for those things on that first take and then make a quick suggestion. I'll know immediately whether it's best and, and often it's best to go that way and then, you know, yeah, half and half, like the other half, get them to break it up. Yeah, so my awareness of producers began before. Um, nah, it happened at the same time. I was getting gear when I was 13 years old, 12, 13 years old, I was about a year. So at that point, two things amazed me. Rick Rubin amazed me, and Todd Rundgren amazed me. His work on Skylarking. So it was both. XTC were amazing, but I wasn't aware of them. I was 12 years old, saw Dear God on video channel, which music, and listened to it, and then I was like, oh, how... I remember saying to myself after the third or fourth listen or something after the first listen, I didn't get it. But it was like, whoa, what, what is... And then by the fourth listen, I asked myself, how 
did they do it? Who fuck is Todd Rundgren? What is Alchemy Productions? How did, okay, how did they do this? And then, okay, years and years. And then the other thing was Rick Rubin, where he brought, you know, the, uh, he was doing rap, but then at the same time he was doing Masters of Reality called Electric, first Danzig records. Those records were so refreshing to a 13-year-old kid's ears because the heaviest thing on the airways was Don, Don, Don Johnson heartbeat. That was, because it had a guitar, we were like, oh, well, it's not bad. And then, you know, uh, the Rick Rubin, the um, Run DMC, Aerosmith track came out, you know, amazing. And then Cult Electric, I mean, he, he just went back and was like making How's the Holy and, and Back in Black. And it was, I mean, it was refreshing. It didn't sound old, it sounded brand new. It was, it was so great and it influenced the later, you know, 90s stuff that came out as dry and <coughs> rock based. So Rick Rubin and Todd Rundgren were the things that, like, if that was the question, I can't even remember. Mm -hmm.